Good afternoon or evening uh, or very early morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the first South Asia Initiative webinar uh, from APARC here at Stanford of 2023. Today, we are continuing a theme from late last year on interrogating the economic prospects and political economy of India. The particular focus for today's discussion is India's approach to globalization. Now, globalization has globally uh, been in retreat in the last few years. The flows of money and information have slowed somewhat as countries react to successive economic shocks uh, and in response to mounting strategic tensions, especially relating to China. India has, of course, been no exception to this. Early in the pandemic, the Modi government announced a policy of Atmanir Bharat, or self-reliance, or self-reliant India. Uh, and today, we're going to examine that balance in Indian policy, that shifting balance between globalization and Atmanir Bharat. What are the roots of this shift? How is it progressing now? And what are its prospects? Now, joining me to explain all of this to me, mostly because I need help when it comes to economics, uh, two of the best people for the job. Uh, Nirvika Singh is a distinguished professor of economics at UC Santa Cruz, and we at APARC are lucky enough to have him here as a visiting scholar this academic year. Surupa Gupta is a professor of political science focusing on political economy at the University of Mary Washington. You can read more about each of our uh, experts uh, on our event page, but between them, suffice to say that they are the best people to help us understand the economics and the politics around India's approach to globalization. Welcome to our distinguished experts. I'd like to begin uh, by understanding essentially how we got here. Let's build a common platform for, for, for our discussion today. The conventional wisdom is that India began to open up significantly to globalization in the early 1990s, right? The reforms that began in 1991. So the question to start with is how has that experiment with globalization worked for India? Uh, Nirvika, if I can start with you on the economics, what has been the, the impact of globalization on Indian economic performance and growth over the past, where are we now, 30 years? Thank you, Arzan. It's, it's really great to be part of this panel. Uh, very quickly, I, th I think the reforms in India have two components. One has been purely domestic, which was the uh, removal of much of the industrial licensing, you know, the license permit quota Raj. Uh, and uh, that certainly has had some impacts on uh, the performance of the Indian economy. On the external front, there were two components that were really important. One was uh, basically getting rid of um, uh, the quotas, import quotas, and then uh, prohibitive tariffs, which, which were e effectively, uh, as, uh, you know, basically creating zero quotas in, in many cases. And of course, the other component of that was freeing up the exchange rate. So allowing the exchange rate to uh, so not completely float freely, but uh, uh, it was, it's been a managed float and the, the rupee has steadily depreciated over these decades, as one would expect. And uh, I think that certainly has contributed to um, India's growth performance. Um, I think India's exports have done reasonably well, uh, but um, uh, it's it's not been anything, um, anything spectacular in the sense that uh, India's share of world trade now is, you know, still only 3%. It hasn't grown that much from uh, two, three decades ago, and it, it's a you know just one sixth of say I think China's uh, share of world trade. So I I, I think the uh, uh, the reforms made a difference, but not as much of a difference as one might have expected, and that's something that I think is still a uh, a policy issue for for India. Yeah, that's really interesting because because you know for for non economists like myself, the the received wisdom is that. Everything changed in 1991, and it unleashed India. And India has since then been unstoppable. Um, so it's, it's so it's an interesting uh, antidote to, to to hear what what you have to say. So, Rupa, could I turn a little bit to the politics of globalization? Again, focused on the sort of past three decades, right? Uh, as these 
economic policies have been enacted by successive governments. Uh, what has been the political reception to them in India? I, presumably, there are some groups that have welcomed them, championed them. There are others that haven't. Uh, so on balance, how would you characterize the political dimension to globalization to date? Um, let me begin by thanking you for having me here as well um, and for the kind introduction. Right off the bat, when uh, the 1991 reforms were um, uh, put in place, uh, there was some pushback from the farming sector, some pushback from uh, what was known as the what became to be known as the Bombay Club a group of industrialists. Um, the farm sector reforms were not really related to um, the overall liberalization to bal to sort of uh, decrease government spending. Uh, one of the things that the that uh, the Indian government was trying to do was to reduce farm sector subsidies, and that is something that has uh, that effort has gone on uh, for the last thirty years in different phases. And so there was some pushback right off the bat, and then uh, the Bombay Club. Uh, these group of industrialists, uh, they were primarily concerned that India, uh, Indian large companies might be sort of acquired by foreign companies. So that was sort of the uh, undertone. Um, but really what they said at the time was that, you know, we are not afraid of competition, but we need a level playing field. We need certain policies to be enacted in India, um, certain infrastructural capacities to be built before we are thrown open to competition. And so those two themes have remained within Indian politics. And um, gradually that, you know, obviously there were some, there are some sectors that have benefited tremendously, textile being one of them, uh, pharmaceuticals being one of them, uh, obviously, everybody talks about software um, and uh, business processing, uh, like service sec the service sector, actually a part of the ser service sector. So these uh, sectors have benefited and they are supporters of globalization. But, the, uh, but a large part of manufacturing and big business and some uh, subsectors within agriculture, or I would say some groups within agriculture have stayed continuously resistant to globalization in different ways. They have not really said anything about globalization per se, but the policies that the government needs to um, bring uh, to, to push this globalization uh, forward, um, they've pushed back against those policies. Yeah, and and no doubt, you know, the, the, the textbook economists would tell you that globalization is good because it increases efficiency and it increases production, but there are of course losers from globalization as well. Uh, so Nirika, can we, can we, can I ask you about that? You know, in countries like the United States, economic reforms and econ and especially reforms designed to, to optimize globalization created many um, economic uh, losers, people who did not benefit from those policies, right? Does India have a rust belt that was created by these policies? Are there sectors of the Indian economy that pre-2020, right? We're, we're not, let, let's not, let's not jump up to 2020 yet, but over the past three decades or so, were there parts of the Indian economy, economy that just proved to be uncompetitive and were left by the wayside because of globalization? Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I, I think any uh, uh, parallel with the Rust Belt would be hard to draw because uh, I think, again, in India never reached that stage of uh, you know, pervasive industrialization and development uh, that, that would uh, you know, allow for this kind of uh, uh, you know, deterioration in, in uh, conditions in certain industries. Yeah, it, as, as Surabha was saying, you know, in many cases where there was a potential for that kind of erosion, I, I think there was uh, preemptive uh, political resistance for, for a long time. For example, FDI uh, in retail uh, was, was uh, completely you know, off the table. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, the, again, the other, the other area where I think you've had a lot of resistance has not necessarily been tied to globalization, but uh, it has been resistance to privatization in uh, you know sectors such as uh, the power sector and uh, transportation. I think uh, for for many 
Indians, uh, you know, that that has been a greater concern that you know they're going to lose their their government jobs with privatization. Uh, another area has been banking, where there's been resistance to privatization. So, so I I I, I would say that that has been some, uh, in many respects more salient in in Indian uh, domestic political economy than globalization. I mean, I, I in some sense India is only now really coming to grips with <laughs> globalization. It's, and it, it, it's been kind of postponing that, that that day in some sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's, I mean, there's there's obviously there's many critiques of globalization, right? And one of them that that we hear is the is the one I think that was popularized by Raghuram Rajan that there is a third pillar to economies that has been neglected by globalization. To to either of you, Nirika or Swarupa, what what is your how how does that apply to India? What what is the third pillar, and how does that apply to What's happened in India uh, with the with the acceleration in recent decades of globalization? Well, I'll I'll give a very quick answer, and then I'd love to hear what Surpa has to say. And so, uh, Raghu's three pillars are state, market, and community, and he's adding community to state and market. And honestly, I, I feel like his um, his framework is really um, you know it's it's interesting from the point of view of uh, a developed country. Um, you know, he's talking about in precisely the Rust Belt and, you know, the dis destruction of cities like Detroit and, D Detroit and so on. But uh, uh, I again, I don't think India ever got to that stage where you had uh, uh, a vibrant local economies that were, you know, going to be, um, going to be uh, undermined by globalization. In fact, in India is still figuring out how to uh, uh, create these, uh, these kind of power, you know, powerful economic re regions. So uh, it, it, it's, I think it's very different from what Raghu is saying. Anything to add, Sorupa? Yeah, sure. Um, I, yeah, I think what you see um, in India is sort of more um, sectoral pushback. So if you look at the community level, uh, if you look, uh, for example, in the last five years, there have been plenty of farmers protests, right? And um, again, not, not a lot of this has anything directly to do with globalization, but you can kind of see that some types of growth has um, has a connection. So the 2020 farmers protests, which were big and which stayed for a long time, uh, they were definitely part of you know this effort to uh, build supply chains um, and create agricultural marketing networks and so on with the goal of exporting more. Um, the reason they were there was pushback against it is completely different. It doesn't have as much to do with resistance to globalization, but they, but we saw those kinds of protracted protests that stayed for um, an entire year and forced the government to um, rescind the policies. So, um, but the, those are not isolated. I mean, in 2018, I think there was a 200 kilometer march uh, by 60 to 70,000 farmers in Maharashtra. So there's been quite a bit of pushback there. And then one other thing that while Nirvikar is right, there is there are no equivalents of Rust Belt in India, simply because that kind of industrialization never took place. But there are sectors that have been hurt as India has had to open up, maybe because of uh, WTO related liberalization or um, or sort of autonomous liberalization, so to speak. Um, and, you know, Chinese goods have taken over like toy manufacturing, bicycle manufacturing, and those kinds of things. So uh, there is a certain uh, level of discomfort with those processes. But there are, again, there are, uh, you know, the middle class has, for the most part, uh, benefited with the number of things that are available right now that compared to when we were growing up in India. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And 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 you and you and it's interesting that you you raised China, right? And especially China's recently increasing market share in in sort of consumer goods. Um and and that sort of brings me now to uh to the let's say the the trend that I want to focus on, which is the the policy shift beginning in 2020 that very explicitly wanted to build self-reliance get away from globalization and I want to and that's a that's that's like I said in the intro that's something that is global that that many countries have experienced but I want to deal with the specifics of the Indian case I want to understand the roots of that shift in India uh, so to begin with again a question I think for both of you even though the pandemic seemed to be the catalyst 
for these policies. I wonder to what extent was this already coming? Was this was this an inevitable policy shift that we were going to see anyway? And COVID just happened to be the 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 thing that prompted it, pushed it, gave an opportunity to enact it, or was it really something that was a, 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 a deliberate response to COVID um, and would not have otherwise happened had it not been for the pandemic? Uh, Nirvika and then Surupa. Yes, so uh, from my perspective, this is a very old trope in uh, Indian politics, you know, various ideas of self-reliance and, uh, uh, you know, going back to uh, uh, the colonial period. And uh, it, I think it's very deeply rooted in Indian politics. And uh, uh, in some sense, this is just the, the latest uh, version of that. Uh, to answer your question a little more specifically, I, uh, I think analysts are... Uh, Basically, seeing this, uh, you know, self-reliance trope as, as uh, in some sense, a continuation of uh, ideas like "Make in India," and uh, um, I, I think uh, the COVID pandemic just, I think, um, offered a, a politically opportune time to uh, broaden and repackage, uh, repackage this this idea. And in, in fact, if you look at some of the recent rhetoric. Representatives of the ruling party are saying, uh, or spokespeople for the ruling party are saying, oh, it's not just about self-reliance; it's about self-confidence, and you know they're, they're basically turning it into um, a kind of, uh, you know, again, a national pride thing. And uh, so that that aspect of uh, uh, self-reliance, I think, is is uh, way beyond just just the economic uh, economic aspects. And we can come back to the economic aspects, but I'll I'll hand over to Silva here. Um, yeah, so Nirvika talked about Make in India. Make in India uh, was a program sort of uh, sounded very much like uh, like the traditional import substitution industrialization style policy framework. Um, although the goal was to seek foreign direct investment, but Make in India was announced uh, soon after Mr. Modi came to power in um, 2014. And, and if you look at the government's 2015 trade policy document, again, you see that kind of, you know, effort to pick winners. And, you know, uh, it is truly a part of Indian policymaking for a long time, but there was really a, a conscious effort to talk about these things in different policy documents. In the last five, six years, there was also an uptick in tariffs which was also with the goal of protecting some um, Indian sectors. And then, of course, the uh, very controversial topic of uh, withdrawing from the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, all of those kind of showed that, you know, this, uh, although the last bit was not really uh, pushed towards self-reliance, that has a different explanation, but uh, this uh, focus towards looking inward and trying to focus on uh, policies that would make India more self-reliant, um, whatever that, however that might play out. That was definitely being talked about even before COVID. But but help me understand the, the impulse behind this, right? I, I completely understand and accept that this has always been a trend. It's always been lurking beneath the surface, right? There's always been a, a strain of self-reliance in India. But but what was it that in the late 20 teens, around 2020, pushed the government? I mean, okay, again, granted, with Make in India, that was more a, an attempt to attract FDI and, and to build Indian capacity, right? But that's different to uh, a, an impulse towards self-reliance, or is it not? What What is it that around 2020 drove the government to make this political decision was it, as we see in the United States, for example, that beating up on China is politically expedient? Was it, as we see in the United States and across the world, the fear that uh, supply chains are vulnerable and therefore uh, we should seek to, to, to secure them? What was the impulse that drove this policy shift? Surupa and then Nirika. This is a... This is a challenging question to for sure um i would speculate that this was a this was an opportunity for the government the that covid so these were in the works these were 
policies that the government was trying to implement, COVID just offered an opportunity to make some changes that they had not made before. And, you know, it, any any student of Indian uh, political economy will say that um, cri uh, crisis, um, Indian reforms are very crisis led. Um, you know, 1991, the, the reason there were reforms is because there was a crisis. Um, similarly, COVID offered a crisis uh, situation and it just pro it just provided political opportunity for the government. That's how I would um, interpret it. That's interesting. That's 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 not dissimilar to defense reforms. Nirvika? Yeah, no, I I I, I uh, totally agree with that. Uh, uh, and I think it was also defensive in the sense that if you think back to when this was announced uh, and became a big thing, it was uh, just a few weeks after the lockdown, and the lockdown, as you recall was just a disaster, uh, po potentially a big political disaster for, for the ruling party. And uh, uh, you know, whatever else you think of um, uh, Narendra Modi, he's, he's a master politician. And I, I think this was a part of his way of, of changing the narrative, building on these um, you know, prior, um, prior attempts to you know, create essentially a new version of import substituting industrialization. What is interesting to me is that you know now you know we're in uh, 2023, three almost three years later, and the government is trying very hard to you know balance these things because if, if you look at what what um, officials who um, uh, have an influence in economic policy are saying, they're saying oh the, you know this this uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat does not mean that we're withdrawing from you know globalization, and uh, in fact uh, they're explicitly saying oh this is you know. Uh, foreign direct investment is actually completely consistent with uh, uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, and uh, uh, so I, I, I think they they're trying to um, uh, you know have their political cake uh, as well as the e economic cake, uh, and uh, uh, you know they, they might well pull it off because uh, you know they're they're speaking to two different constituencies, and uh, uh, it. it it, it, it's that that that's how I read what what is happening in India. Uh, they, they want to be uh, they want to take advantage of globalization uh, and this, these opportunities. I, I think there's some very obviously some very smart uh, people you know in, in government. And at the same time, there's always this impulse of uh, you know making sure that you win the next election. And I, I think the ruling party's um, goal is to never lose another election. So. Uh, <laughs> so so to that point let me let me ask you Surupa, let me let me um, uh, uh, to, 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 to to make it a finer point has it worked politically uh if if we if we accept Nurika's contention that this is that this was a, a an opportunistic attempt to change the narrative to appeal to the base has it worked uh so far granted that it's early days but has it worked so far in um, uh, shoring up political support for economic policies of the current government? We haven't really had, we've had some state level elections. We haven't really had national level elections since Atmanirbhar Bharat was uh, announced in 2020. But if we look at Make in India and kind of think that, you know, that was just another version of it, well, clearly Mr. Modi did not lose his um, popularity, uh, in fact, you know, came back uh, with a larger proportion of um, votes um, in his favor. I think I would be cautious about one thing, though, that the elections, that economic policy or economic reforms have mattered in these elections uh, to a large extent. Uh, although, you know, both in the first and the second, the rhetoric has been that, uh, you know, he stands for development. Uh, and uh, admittedly, you know, there are a number of things that he has done, you know, sort of his, his administration has done uh, building latrines, for example, providing gas uh, connections to poor households, things that matter. But those are the kinds of things that have continued to build his popularity. 
economic reforms have not really been put on the ballot, so to speak. And that's that's a common thing in India. Economic reforms tend to not be put on the ballot. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really interesting point. It's and and I guess that is really where the rubber hits the road, right? Because the, on the one hand, there is a there is an economic incentive to reform, but on the other hand, the thing that wins elections is almost the opposite of that. It's mm-hmm. it's um, it's it's not uh, uh, certainly not liberalisation reforms. So mm-hmm. let me now turn to where we are in this shift, right? I don't understand whether. Atmanir Barbarat is a set agenda of N items, of N policy initiatives that the government is going to systematically work through, or is this a sort of catch-all term that's going to be a perpetual campaign with no beginning, no middle, and no end? So can you give us a sense, uh, starting with you, Nirvika, of from a from an economic policy perspective has are we just at the very very beginning of the journey towards self-reliance of course india is not self-reliant yet but is this is 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 it a matter of okay many of the policies have been enacted and now we just have to wait for them to play out or is it a matter of we haven't even begun to enact the reforms necessary for the vision of Atmanir Mubarak. So I, I think um, the um, failure of you know making India to achieve any significant uh, progress was uh, uh, one factor in in uh, you know Indian policy making makers thinking, and uh, I I think they're still trying to figure out how to um, how to. Uh, accelerate economic development. I think they understand that you need more investment, that this has to be uh, come from uh, you know, uh, abroad, some of it because there just isn't enough uh, uh, savings capacity in, in within India. But you can see that the Indian government is ra- ramping up its own capital expenditure. And while it's done some targeted uh, welfare programs, it's also trying to cut that back on some of the things like employment guarantee schemes, you know, allowing them to uh, uh, kind of erode in, in real terms. Um, uh, one thing I noticed in the budget, and I, I, I don't think I missed anything, uh, the uh, uh, government did not uh, really, uh, you know, uh, ramp up tariffs again. And I think they're getting the message from policymakers that they trust that this is not going to help. And that, you know, in some sense, increasing tariffs, especially on um, uh, inputs, intermediate goods, in, in some sense, cancels out the subsidies that uh, they're giving with the uh, you know, production-linked incentive scheme. And of course, the PLI was part of this uh, effort to uh, make, make in India you know, actually do something, right? So, but I, I, I think they realize that uh, they've got to get investment, that they've got to be part of global value chains. And you can see that that's what the economic policymakers are saying you know, you read the finance minister's uh, statements and so on, that, okay, we, we've got to, uh, you know, build our infrastructure, be part of these global value chains. And in, in some sense, that's that's the real, uh, uh, I, th- I think that's the real uh, goal. So, and I, I think some of the shift in the the uh, political rhetoric of uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat is precisely for that reason. They're saying, oh, it's not just self-reliance, it's also, you know, self-confidence so that, uh, it 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 uh, kind of delinks that that uh, rhetoric, political rhetoric, from what they want to do in terms of uh, economic policy making. I, I think the government's the government really does uh, uh, want to achieve economic growth, but uh, it's not clear that they figured out how to do that in terms of the details of um, you know creating uh, really effective export zones or uh, uh, you know making it uh, attracting attracting you know tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars of foreign direct investment at the same scale that China did. Right? So I, I, I think that they want to do it. They haven't quite figured it out. So is there a sense, is there a sense, this, this raises an interesting question that if, as the years go by, if there are strong economic reasons not to enact certain policies that would otherwise be good for self-reliance, is there is there a chance that this then just becomes 
a hollow shell, a rhetorical device to which there is no real substance, or is that, or, or, or I mean, because obviously there's 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 a, there's political utility, right, in this concept, in this idea. The the question I guess I have is, where does the the immovable object meet the irresistible force? Like where where is that? So so if there is this political impulse to to enact self reliance, but there are economic costs to it. How far will they go? How committed are they to this political notion? And and are they committed enough to absorb self-imposed economic costs for it? Let me try to answer this by looking at what happened when Atmaninbhar Bharat was announced. One of the some of the things that Mr. Modi uh, uh, announced alongside was that uh, the reforms should include include, for example supply chain reforms for agriculture, rational tax system, improving human resources. Uh, what happened in September 2020 was that the government government passed the uh, uh, agricultural uh, supply chain reforms, right? But then there was this pushback. And so this pushback that stayed for a whole year, which eventually led in, I think, November of 2021, led the government to rescind the laws, the three laws that it had passed. And it's interesting because these are laws, or at least the overall, the reforms have had support from economists for more than 20 years. So it was it was a big surprise that there was so much pushback against it. Uh, not, I mean, politically, there wasn't that much of a surprise, but you know, it, it wasn't that this these were very new suggestions, right? So once that happened, given that that was one of the big uh, uh, part of this vision of Atmanirbhar Bharat, I think reforms definitely have slowed down, right? Uh, and, you know, that was the immovable object that, uh, you know, kind of forced reforms to slow down to a certain extent. So in a way, what the Modi government was saying is that you know, to become self-reliant, we need reforms that are actually more outward looking to a certain extent, more liberal, more outward looking, but that didn't go well, right? Even, even with the, within a, uh, a, a political environment where people were distracted by COVID, by all the hardships that, um, you know, people faced, um, if you think about spring of 2021, India had the horrible second wave. But through all of that, the response, the resistance stayed put. So that was, I think, the immovable object. And so it would be interesting to see what happens for where we go from here with respect to reforms. Um, there, there are some areas maybe where uh, the government can enact some reforms, but um, these kinds of large reforms, I think, where there's political pushback, the government is going to be very cautious because um, I, no government wants to lose elections. And Nirvikar was right that uh, there is a there is a the the goal is to always win elections in in this case. So, yep. Can, can Nirvika, can you? I, I again, I realize we're we're not even three years into this uh, policy. But is there any are there any leading indicators of of the effect of these policies on the Indian economy? Uh, I don't think I have my ear close enough to the ground to um, uh, be able to tell. And um, I, I think uh, I think the I mean, my all I can all I can uh, sense is that the Indian policymaking establishment realizes that uh, there there is you know th th this is an inflection point in the global economy. And uh, you know, at the beginning of COVID, you know, self-reliance sounded like a, a good, uh, a, a good, uh, uh, you know, rhetorical device because the whole world was was shutting down, and now everything is opening up again, and people are saying, okay, what's the alternative to China, and uh, so on. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, again, I, I think one of the one of the drivers of this government, like like many other governments, is, is uh, you know, uh, improving material well-being. And uh, I think it's not just winning elections, but also I, I, I think uh, uh, policymakers want to feel that you know they've done something good. But what what I've seen it happening in in uh, uh, the life of this this government is uh, 
basically politics trumps economics. Uh, and one example of that was um, uh, demonetization, which I think was driven by, this is anecdotal, but was driven by the uh, campaign financing issues in the UP elections, Uttar Pradesh elections. And I think, again, I think um, this is anecdotal, but one of the reasons that the government rescinded the farm bills was because the, uh, again, the Uttar Pradesh uh, assembly elections were coming up. And uh, I mean, to put it to put it very cynically, I don't think Punjab farmers protesting would have made any difference to the government, but farmers from Uttar Pradesh protesting had a huge impact on the government and uh, because they needed to control Uttar Pradesh, you know, for all kinds of political reasons. You know. So uh, it, it's a very complex story. And I think what the government is trying to figure out is how to, um, how to um, uh, you know, keep political power based on its, um, on its sort of cultural nationalist uh, vision. And uh, at the same time, um, you know, leave, leave, a, leave a legacy, which they also want to do, because you know, uh, talking about past, cult past glories, is, ultimately it wears thin unless you actually are delivering something to people. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, so one of, one of the things I think um, one or both of you alluded to this, uh, one of the big hopes associated with the post-COVID decoupling from China was that India would wind up attracting much of the uh, investment that flowed out of China or, or could yet flow out of China. Uh, to, to what extent, A, has that happened, or B, more broadly, have you heard any anything, be it anecdotal or not, about how foreign companies seeking to work in India, invest or trade in India, how have they, uh, how has their experience changed in the last couple of years because of these policies? Uh, again, I, I don't think I have any really uh, uh, good information on, on that. And uh, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so anything to add? Little, um, you know, sort of much has been made of the fact that Apple decided to move uh, some of its production to India, right? Um, but if you really look at which country has benefited the most from uh, you know, any kind of decoupling with China um, or any type of French shoring, it's Vietnam, it's not India yet. Um, and I say yet because, uh, it, as you said earlier, these are early days, um, but Vietnam has benefited a lot and in part probably because it already has some of the some of the uh, pieces in place that would allow it to benefit from um, from this kind of global shift in focus. Uh, I'm I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you had you, you mentioned these pieces that are in place because now we're gonna we're gonna turn to the future of globalization. India's approach to globalization in the 2020s, I think, is the title of this webinar. Um, and the future of the, the, the corollary is the future of Atmanibha Bharat. So Nirika, please use small words when you answer this question. Um, <laughs> no. I, I, I um, probably won't so, understand much of it, but the, the question is, let yeah, me ask so, you, yeah, so, so what, you can't, sorry, go what, ahead. Pieces, what pieces does India need to put in place in order for this policy, this constellation of policies, this approach to work? Sure. Yeah, so I, I, I think the, you know, the, the, the usual list includes um, further reforms in labor laws, which are happening slowly, and then uh, Maybe even bigger is, uh, you know, reforms in in um, uh, land markets, and uh, that's more complicated politically for various reasons. But I, you know, there are ways around it too. I think, you know, allowing allowing uh, you know states to have uh, a, you know a, a share of the pie in some sense. You know, when you're creating these, uh, say, export export zones and so on. I, I think a big piece of it is, and this is something that the finance minister has said that we need to India needs to you know, achieve skilling to scale. That, that's, I think, going to be a challenge for India unless it actually um, it globalizes its education industry, which I, I, I know would be anathema to the uh, Indian government, uh, again, because of, you know, cultural nationalism. But in, in, in many ways, that, that ends up being a binding constraint, you know, the, the uh, skill shortages in India. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you just explain that? What, did, what do you mean by globalizing the, the education sector? I, I mean, allowing uh, free entry of foreign uh, 
education providers, universities, and so on into India. Uh, you know, either either in partnerships or or independently. And India has been very reluctant to do that in any significant way. So I mean, people talk people talk about FDI and retail, which is all fine, but I I feel like uh, there'd be much more much more benefit to India from FDI and education rather than retail. Uh, I, I know that's kind of a slightly off on, off uh, mainstream view, but well, actually, Koshi Basu has said something similar, so I'm not out of out of line. Uh, yeah, so I think other other analysts have have basically said you need policy, you need some kind of certainty, right? So uh, uh, Joshua Feldman and uh, Arvind Subramanian have been saying, oh, you know, there, there's too much uncertainty, too much back and forth. And so policy consistency is going to be very important. And going back to your earlier points, I think in some sense the the political rhetoric I think is is creating some uncertainty for for my I, I don't have evidence, but my guess is that you know foreign investors are trying to figure out is is it is it just you know talk or is is it actually going to affect us? And uh, uh, and I think the government is also trying to figure out how to how to manage both you know to uh, kind of sell that. Uh, uh, Cultural, uh, cultural self uh, confidence uh, notion, while simultaneously, you know, relying on foreign investment for economic development. Surupa, is this all a, an economic pipe dream, or is it politically feasible? You know, this this notion that reforms can go through. Uh, some of these reforms, like land land reforms, for example, or labor reforms. I think the you know sub successive governments have been trying to do these and uh, have you know, faced opposition. Um, some of these might be easier to do probably at the state level and then you know, uh, other states can then see how some states are growing and then maybe they can feel that they need to do it as well. The, that could be one way of doing it. But uh, you know, these blockbuster reforms at the national level seem to attract a lot more political attention and might be harder to harder to push through. Um, and then, you know, will India be able to take advantage of uh, decoupling with China? Also, uh, its approach towards trade. I mean, although you we are really focusing on foreign direct investment, there are some policies that uh, facilitate trade that also facilitate global value chains. And if that's where you want to insert yourself, you need to pay attention to that. And again, going back to the Vietnam example, uh, if I may, um, Vietnam has uh, gotten into a number of large FTAs, foreign, uh, you know, uh, free trade agreements, RCEP and CPTPP are two of them, uh, but also with the US, with trying one with the European Union. Um, India's had a hard time doing it because doing these things, in part because uh, of the domestic reforms they, they, re they would require of India, right? Um, and the political uh, pushback uh, on account of that. So that's sort of my not terribly optimistic response. So, but but you raise a really interesting point, right? This idea of I don't I don't know if this is really about federalism, but it's it's sort of it, it's related to federalism, right? This this idea of competitive federalism with states setting a, an example for emulation. We've we've got a, a, a there's a couple of questions from um, from our audience that I want to address. One of them is that specific question: Are there to get really down to the nuts and bolts, are there some states in India uh, which are innovators, policy innovators, that are already sources of emulation uh, in, in the rest of the country, whether that emulation happens or not? Are there, are there sources of emulation? You know, people used to years ago talk about Gujarat as being one of them when, when Modi was CM. Is that still true of Gujarat? Uh, and then we'll, we, we've also got a second question that I want to come back to about RCEP, which has been mentioned a couple of times, but but not to preempt that. Let's let's first Surupa and then Nirvika, if you could quickly, are there are there any particular states that are particular bright spots? Overall, I think the South has done better than the North. Uh, the West and the West has done better than the East. Those are sort of broad, um, you know, broad stroke. Um, descriptions. Um, among the southern states, I think in recent years, Tamil Nadu has done well. Um, in the West, Maharashtra, Gujarat continue to do well. Um, Odisha 
was talked off as one of the country uh, states that um ha have uh, that has done pretty well but uh, you know compared to the northern states in general where you know for example human resources which is one of the things that we talked about in a in a, a, a bit ago um you know just pr provision of education uh, has not been as successful in the north um, as it has been in the south. So I think uh, we could look at, you know, parse these things more carefully and see where exactly um, states have done better than others. Uh, the uh, some of the states have taken up exactly the kind of agricultural reforms that uh, the federal government tried to do three years ago, and they have done it fairly successfully. Nirvika, any, any views on this, on the states? Yeah, so, no, I, I, I totally agree with Surupa. And uh, I, I think um, that there's no uh, uh, enormous successes. I mean, some states have done better than others. Uh, uh, you, you know, you can compare, for example, in the north, you can compare Punjab and Haryana and, and see what, you know, they've gone in very different uh, paths and you can understand clearly why. I think part of the problem is that uh, and this goes back to the you know the way that India is uh, uh, India's uh, federal system works. I think it's a little harder in India to carve out uh, a particular region and just say okay we're going, just going to let this this uh, you know part of uh, the country just roar ahead. And in some sense that's what China did. You know it it, it created these these large uh, uh, economic zones and and made them uh, growth poles for the entire economy. And uh, you know they just they just uh, fuel fueled everything. Now, if, if you did that in in Tamil Nadu, uh, you can imagine the political fallout that would uh, you know uh, happen in that case in terms of uh, you know uh, maintaining the national coalition. So again, I I, I think that one of the challenges for <laughs> uh, you know again I'm, I'm venturing into political science, but one of the challenges for this government is that it it's um, it's stronger, its base is stronger in the North and West, or, or, and you know, part of the West, but uh, uh, the the greatest potential for creating an economic engine is in the South. And that, that, that you know, you can see their political strategy is, is to, you know, keep moving South and create a, you know, broader based, uh, uh, you know, Hindu nationalism. Unfortunately, these, 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 these two things are tied, you know, the, the particular brand of, um, you know, uh, natural integration that is being pursued, and uh, uh, you know the the uh, uh, political economy of actually, uh, you know, pushing pushing certain kinds of reforms regionally. You know, you you, you can see this in in the uh, Indian Sagarmala program, which is, you know, lots of small uh, export export zones, and none of them is big enough to really you know matter in terms of you know participating in global value chains. So. It, and this, this is one of the weaknesses of Indian democracy, right? That uh, you know, uh, people have talked about this. Uh, you you want to keep everybody happy, <laughs> but as a result, you you never really kind of uh, make make a big big move. You know, you you're, it's harder to achieve those structural changes that are needed. And uh, yeah, that that that's been uh, the case for decades decades throughout uh, the different governments. Thanks. Thank you. So let me let me turn to uh, one or two more quick questions from the audience um, where our time is, is running short. Um, rapid fire questions on RCEP, right, which is which which you guys have already mentioned the again, the uh, lay general interpretation in among many Western observers was that not joining RCEP was a missed opportunity for India. Um, what really a is the reason behind uh, uh opting out of RCEP and uh b what is the opportunity cost or the 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 what is india missing out on uh from that decision nirika and then suruba uh actually i'll i'll, I'll defer to suruba on this one okay so why did India opt out of RCEP? There are two explanations. Um, the big one is, of course, China. And, uh, you know, being a part of RCEP would have meant having, a, in effect, a free trade agreement with China, which meant that there would be more sectors that will face competition from Chinese goods. So that was definitely one. Um, but, uh, but even a larger one was that, you know, RCEP is likely to be a China-dominated um, trade infrastructure or architecture, and 
it, there are arguments both in favor and against it. One argument that is in favor is that, um, you know, you want to be inside to be able to shape that architecture. If you're not part of it, then you have no influence at all. And the other argument is that, well, we don't want to do, we don't want to have anything to do with China. We want to be with the other part of the world, right? Um, the the rest of the world. So, so uh, I think uh, the fear of China's, you know, the the increasing trade deficit with China definitely played a lot into uh, the decision to uh, get out of RCEP. Um, also, there were some technicalities, for example how exactly service sectors were going to be liberalized and so on. Uh, those were questions that India kept asking and uh, presumably didn't get a good answer. So um, that led to the decision to get out of RCEP. So there was a strategic aspect to it and an economic side to it. Um, to answer the second question, whether there is um, hand-wringing now in New Delhi, I actually haven't been able to go back and really talk to people a lot but india had quite a few chances to join like when it came out in 2019 it could have rejoined one year later um and everybody has said that you know the doors open but i don't see that there's been any effort so far i have one last question given that we're right up against the time and 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 it really you you provided an, an excellent segue surupa just now when you were talking about the difference between the, the economic impulses and the political impulses. And when we're talking about globalization, when we're talking about the new uh, concept that people have been talking about to, to sort of uh, bridge these worlds of globalization and self-reliance, people have been talking about friend shoring, right? This idea that there are more politically reliable or secure partners uh, with which countries would be nominally happier to integrate, right? To have their supply chains and their markets integrated. The question I have for you, especially, you know, you just talked about how uh, there were both economic and political dangers with RCEP for, for integrating with China. The question I have for both of you, and this is the last question I will ask you, is when we think of things like French shoring or other principles, to what extent do India's strategic and economic priorities overlap? Or to what extent do they conflict? So when we talk about French roaring, Swarup, as you were saying, the sort of the non-China part of the world, right? Um, is Does that also make, it, it clearly makes good strategic sense and good political sense. Does it also make good economic sense? Or is there a sense that you kind of have, there's a trade-off and you kind of have to choose one over the other? Um, I'll first ask you, Surupa, and then uh, Nirvika, you'll have the final word. Well, India and the US have tried to uh, move towards a free trade agreement, a bilateral investment treaty, all kinds of things. And those efforts have really gone nowhere, because, in part because the kinds of requirements that the US has when it's signing a, an FDA with another country, for example, in um, environmental or labor law, le uh, labor legislation, um, India is not at all ready to, to do those. Uh, uh, also, for example, intellectual property rights. There, there are significant differences uh, between where the US would want its close trade partners to go and where India is willing to go. So those have not really led to any kind of um, uh, success. Now, are there places where India can work with uh, the US, Europe, Australia, and others? Uh, there are there may be pockets where they can, but you know, sort of on a on a uh, FTA scale, no. So the the question is, if you are not in RCEP, can you be in another different FTA? The answer has so far been no. So. That's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Nirvika? Yeah, so to bring it full circle, I think uh, the US use of French shoring is a little bit like the Indian use of uh, Atma Nirvad Bharat. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a political device. And uh, I, I think India should, you know, use it to its advantage where it matters, 
but I, I think you know the U.S. is not going to be able to force um, any of its you know multinationals to make enormous investments in India. Uh, so the the real uh, the real drivers are going to be um, you know uh, what multinational corporations want to do, and that then that goes back to the economic realities. Uh, but you know in, in general, I th I think. Um, uh, uh, India's uh, economic partnerships should be uh, as wide as possible. Uh, you know, I, I see no reason why India should not be, you know, looking for uh, advantage in dealing with the United Kingdom or Germany or South Korea. You know, each each of those countries has something different to offer India in terms of economic partnerships. And you know, this can be technology, it can be money, it can be um, uh, some something else, and uh, you know, just building trade channels. So I, I I think you know this this is all about uh, India's strategic interests uh, being um, uh, I think very much aligned with uh, with broad uh, with its broad economic interests and the U.S. the U.S. is is just um, uh, one one player in that and and it, I mean if you think about the world everybody is looking for alternatives to China not just the U.S. and that that in some sense actually gives India leverage where it might not have had it otherwise. And yeah, so I mean, there's Vietnam, there's Bangladesh, but I think India has things to offer that those countries don't have to offer. And I, so I, I, I think Indian policymakers have to be, uh, in this case, somewhat, uh, somewhat bold and uh, aggressive in terms of you know figuring out what what they can get out of the rest of the world. Now that's excellent. Thank you so much. You know, it's it's um, this is this has been a huge education for me. I've I've wanted to do these webinars on economics. Uh, because as someone who studies security, it's patently clear all the time that a country's uh, national security and defense rests on its economic fundamentals, right? That's 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 mm. that's axiomatic and it's and it's definitely true. But what I'm discovering as well in speaking to you is that when we're talking about economics there's no apolitical economics right economics and economic policy is shot through with politics be it electoral politics of up or be it global politics of china and the us um so i don't know where that leaves us i was hoping that you guys would provide some definitive answers but i thank you anyway for for being so gentle with me with your economics uh, and for being uh, such great teachers to us all. Thank you very much, Nirika and Surupa.